chapter 53, from verses 10 to 12. From verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his, off his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our church. It's great to see new faces with us uh, this Easter. Uh, if you're visiting for the first time, we just want to say we're really glad that you're here. Hope you feel welcome today. Please stick around. Uh, we do have a barbecue and some activities uh, later on. Uh, I'd love for you to spend some time with us as a church family, get to know us as we get to know you. Uh, just to also let you know, we're about to look a bit closer at the Bible now. Uh, this is something that we do uh, regularly every Sunday, and that's because we're convinced that whenever we look at the Bible, that's when God speaks to us. That's how God teaches us, corrects us, trains us, and uh, rebukes us. So uh, we'd love for you to see you again, not just on Easter. We'd love to see you uh, in the coming weeks as well, uh, especially if things are a bit not clear today. Please do, don't leave that unresolved. Please do talk to someone. Uh, we'd love to serve you in that way. Uh, let me pray. Uh, we're going to look at the passage now. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Uh, I'd love for you to join, uh, uh, join me, uh, and then we'll look at this passage together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news that Jesus is risen. And Father, we thank you that you've hinted at that uh, in so many parts of Scripture. And thank you that we get to see this most clearly uh, in Jesus at the cross. We thank you for everyone that's gathered here this morning. And we ask that as we hear you, and as we uh, look at your word, that you may speak uh, through me. And may your spirit apply your word to our hearts. Help us to listen carefully to what you have to say here. And show us again the wonders of the cross and all that you've done for us in Jesus. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Well, there is a syndrome called Lazarus Syndrome. If you search it up, you will find out on Wikipedia, there's a whole string of different people uh, that have uh, experienced Lazarus Syndrome. Here are a few of them. According to a 2002 article uh, in the journal Forensic Science International, a 65-year-old Japanese man was found unconscious in his foster home. Uh, CPR was attempted by the home staff, the emergency crew. Uh, they even brought him to ED at the hospital and got a, uh, appropriate medications, defibrillation, all that. He was declared dead, and after, uh, even after attempted resuscitation. But once they transferred him to the morgue, the police found him moving after 20 minutes. And after that, he actually came back and was, stayed alive for another four days. That's one. Uh, another one, Walter Williams, uh, age 78, from Lexington, Mississippi, United States, was at home when a nurse uh, called a coroner uh, to come and examine him. Uh, the coroner arrived and declared him dead at 9 p.m. This was in 2014. Once at the funeral home, he was found to be moving, possibly resuscitated by a defibrillator implanted in his chest. The next day, he was well enough to be talking to his family, and then he survived uh, for another 15 days uh, before he passed away. And this is, uh, there's more, but this is the last one that I'll share, and this is probably the most mind-boggling one. Uh, Velma Thomas, 59, uh, from the United States, she holds the record time for recovering from clinical death. In 2008, she went into cardiac, cardiac arrest at home. Uh, medics, they were able to establish there was a faint pulse after eight minutes of CPR. Her heart stopped twice before she arrived at the hospital. She was placed on life support but eventually she was declared clinically dead. And then for 17 hours, there was no brain activity. Her son even says that her skin started to harden, her hands and toes were curling up, and they were already drawn. She was taken off life support. Funeral arrangements were already in progress. But then, after 10, min 10 more minutes of that, after being taken off life support, she revived and recovered. 
So tweaking that story, she was clinically dead for 17 hours before she re revived and recovered. Now she holds the record uh, for the, the person uh, being clinically dead for the longest. That's recorded in medical history. Uh, there's probably more out there that haven't been recorded. And this, cases like these take their name from Lazarus from the Bible. Uh, Lazarus syndrome is also known as auto-resuscitation after a failed CPR. It reminds us of Lazarus. Uh, if you've been in John's Gospel uh, semi-recently, Lazarus was dead for four days before he was revived when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, and he came back from the dead. He even smelled bad by the time it was four days. And what's amazing here is they, these people were clinically dead. No more movement. Now have to look up the criteria, like, at what point do you declare someone clinically dead? No more movement, no more breathing for at least one minute, no more heartbeat for at least one minute, no more reflexes. Pupils are fixed and dilated, and they don't respond to light anymore. These people were clinically dead from anywhere from 20 minutes up to 17 hours, and they lived to tell the tale. So since 1982, apparently it's happened at least 38 times, but yeah, it's possible that there's more. But these are the only instances of resurrection. Stories of the resurrection appeared even back in ancient cultures. So in, around the world, uh, in places like India, China, Mesoamerica, and, and even Norwegian mythology, you might be familiar with some, some of these. You may have heard of Osiris from ancient Egypt, Odin, any Marvel fans here, Thor's dad is based on this figure, uh, and even Buddha himself. But the difference with Jesus is, there is strong evidence to back up the fact that he truly died, truly rose from the dead, and we can trust what we read here in the scriptures. Lazarus syndrome is the closest thing that we come to in modern times. But truth be told, we don't often confront the resurrection. We don't often pause just to dwell on well, the power of God that is behind this. We can even grow a bit numb to it. You know, every so often, there's a new zombie movie. In games that we play, respawning is a very common thing. I was playing Minecraft with my kids, uh, and a few weeks ago, I was just listening to them, um, trying not to intervene. One of my kids lost uh, the home base. You know, like when you build a, a home in Minecraft, you start to wander off. It's very, very easy to lose your home base. And she, she well, one of my children, couldn't find, figure out how to, how to get back. Oh, no, I gave it away. Forgive me, anyway. Uh, she couldn't figure out how to go back to her home base. And then my oldest was like, oh, just kill yourself. Once you kill yourself, you'll respawn at the house. And I was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That was very casual. Very, very casual. Don't take that one out of context. But there you go. They just become familiar with this idea without confronting the sobering reality behind it, the power of God behind death, a new life from death. We don't think twice about it. But we're going to pause and we're going to confront it today because truly it is scary and amazing at the same time that God can raise someone from the dead. Doesn't that fill us with awe and wonder? Truly. How can anyone do that? It's the power that belongs only to God, the one who creates and the one who gives the breath of life. And we'll spell this more, I'll spell out this more. Uh, uh, either in kind of like after today or in private conversations, in one-to-ones and small groups. But just briefly here, if he has the power to raise someone from dead to life, it means he has total power and complete control over death. It means that this life that we live now is not all that there is because he promises us very clearly in his word that there is life after death. It means that we all need to consider Jesus seriously if we have not already because he is the greatest proof of life after death. And we too will rise from the dead one day. And this truth is not only in the Gospels, it's even hinted here in Isaiah 53. We see glimpses of the resurrection in Isaiah 53. And it all is, it's all surrounding this servant figure. Like we heard on Friday when we looked at the first nine verses of Isaiah 53, the Old Testament is like a shadow Shadows aren't very clear, but when you trace the shadow to its root, it becomes clearer and clearer until you see the actual figure 
100%, we know who this person is. In Isaiah 53, we see the shadow. In Jesus, we see this servant figure in, in all clearness, in all clarity. Uh, he is the one that's being spoken of here. But if we just put that on hold and we come back to Isaiah 53 again, we don't exactly know who this person is. When they first wrote this, they, weren't, they didn't have Jesus back then. And so who is this figure? Isaiah 53 is the fourth of four servant songs. And we've seen so far in Isaiah, if you trace it, this servant figure is a person. This servant figure seems to be Israel. This servant figure is one who suffers. And then on Friday, we see that this servant figure suffers for our sins, is punished in our place to heal our relationship with God. Why does he do that? Because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Our, our hearts are prone to wander. Sorry, I changed it now. Our hearts are prone to wander. Our hearts, they go astray. We wander away from God. And so we need this servant. We need this Jesus to die and rise again. And so the gist here, it's only a few verses in Isaiah 53. We see three things. The servant here, he dies to bear our sins. He is raised to life and he's exalted among the great. We'll, we'll see what, what all that means in a moment. And just before we even dive deeper in there, it might feel very far away from us. I know I definitely get that kind of, that sense whenever I'm in the Old Testament. But if we look at it again, if we pause and dwell on the passage, there are treasures here, and they impact us today. And so let's do that now. Uh, let's look again at what these verses say. Verse 10, this servant dies for our sins. Verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, to be continued in the next verse, but just pause there for now, this might surprise us. And when you look again, why would God want to crush this servant? It's the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. You know, this might be a hard pill to swallow, but God has a good purpose behind this. This servant is crushed and it is all within God's plan and God's purposes for this to happen. And he's shown in different parts of the Bible that God has good purposes behind these difficult times. For example, Joseph in Genesis, he's sold as a slave, but later on, because that happens, he ends up saving his people. Job, uh, not Job, Job, he suffers tremendously. But by the end of it, he grows so much in character. And Jesus himself, crushed at the cross, all within God's plan, God's knowledge, crucified at the hands of sinful and lawless human beings. But because Jesus died, so many people are saved. Here it is his definite plan for this servant figure to be crushed as an offering for sin. Uh, in Old Testament times, the bulls and the goats, they're offered very regularly as a sacrifice for the sins of God's people. And here in Isaiah 53, this particular verse, this is one of the few places that it points to a person rather than an animal as the sacrifice for our sins. This is the shadow that points to Jesus, the sacrifice once and for all, for all the sins of all of God's people, prefigured here. And so the servant, he dies to bear our sins. No one knew at the time just how life-changing this servant's death would be for so many people. And as we keep looking, well, this servant actually doesn't stay dead. There's two hints here that this servant will be raised to life. In other words, resurrection. And so look again at verse 10 with me. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. I must admit, when I first read this, I just glossed over it. I didn't think much. I just thought Isaiah 53 is all about this servant who dies for us. But lo and behold, look here. There are glimpses of the resurrection here that we might be tempted to gloss over. Uh, the first is in the, the highlighted part there. He will see his offspring and prolong his days. This is after the servant is crushed as an offering for sin. But he will prolong his days afterwards. He will see his offspring. 
And the second hint is in verse 11. You know, he will suffer, but then he will see the light of life and be satisfied. You know, it doesn't say resurrection, but the idea is here. And so how do we make sense of what is going on here? This isn't talking about Jesus in the first place. We mentioned this on Friday, that this servant could be anyone from Hezekiah to Cyrus to Jeremiah. There's cases for each of them. But when we look here, none of them really fit this. Who, after their life is given as an offering for sin, can live to see the light of life? If we were back there back then, hearing Isaiah's words for the first time, I think we'd be stumped. You know, there's tension here that remains unresolved. Who is this person? Who can possibly see, die, and then rise again and live for many days afterwards? No one is meant to fit this bill except Jesus. He is the one who's crushed as an offering for our sins. He, was, he is the one who will see his offspring. But hang on a minute, how does that work? It's not like Jesus has children, but God's children are sons of God. We are adopted into the same family. We share a heavenly father. We call each other brothers and sisters in Christ if you follow Jesus. We're not just a physical, we're not physical family, but we're a spiritual family. We are, in a sense, God's offspring by faith. Even when we pray, we pray, our Heavenly Father, and when we do that, it reminds us of our sonship. So that's the first one. Jesus is crushed as an offering for sin. He will see his offspring. We are his children. And the second hint, well, Jesus suffers at the cross, and he sees the light of life afterwards. And there's a little part there that, again, we might overlook. He is satisfied. What's going on there? Let, let's keep the verse up there just so we can see it uh, a little bit more. Whoever's not, yep, thank you. It's that second part that well, what's going on there? He will see the light of life and be satisfied. When Jesus suffers and dies at the cross and is risen to life, God, our Heavenly Father, is satisfied with what is done. The price for our wrongs is finally and fully paid for our record of sins, all of it, for all of God's people, for all time, fully paid for by Jesus' life. And Jesus rises to spread this good news for over 40 days, and now risen into heaven, prolonging his days into eternity. You know, there's meant to be tension here. It can't be anyone else but Jesus, even though in the first instance it's not talking about him. But at the cross, God is satisfied because the full and sufficient payment for our wrongs is paid for. Now, that's a lot of words I've just given you, but let's give you a scenario here. You know, if for some reason, if you drive a car and you drove your car and you crashed it into the front of my house while I'm playing with my kids, playing some board games or playing some guitar, a full and sufficient payment needs to be made. My grass will need fixing. That costs money, that costs time. My windows and my walls will need rebuilding. My kids, if they are injured, they need some their medical treatment. Their fees will need to be paid for. I'd probably appreciate a sorry as well, of some sort. In other words, there's money, monetary payments, and there's also relational payments. There's a relationship that's been uh, fractured. There's a payment that needs to be made in order for let's just say me, in this scenario, to be fully satisfied. Here, in Isaiah 53, and in Jesus, the price for our sins, for all our sins, for all of God's people, that is huge. There is a payment that needs to be made, and only Jesus' life is good enough for that, to restore both uh, the fracture between us and God and the payment for our sins. That's what Jesus does for us. So when God sees Jesus, he is satisfied with all that is done at the cross. Well, what happens afterwards? Uh, if you're familiar with the gospel, you know that Jesus is raised. And again, we see a bit of that here, hinted in Isaiah 53. Because of this work, this servant is exalted. He suffers, is crushed, and is raised. 
And here, if you look again, there is the smallest of clues here to say that this servant will be exalted. And it's there when it says, he'll be given a portion among the great. So let's, let's look, up, uh, look at the verse 11 again. There you go. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Uh, We mentioned on Friday, iniquities, transgressions, there's just another way of saying sin. Another way of thinking about sin is how we wander away from God, we, our hearts go astray, we don't do what God wants us to do. And many people here, they're right with God because of what this servant does. He justifies many. We're called right with God because of what this servant does. This servant carries our sins and speaks for us. He intercedes for the transgressors. And he even dies for us. Now, for those who weren't here on Friday, uh, I shared a bit about uh, my father who uh, was in the Navy uh, in Vietnam. He was a lieutenant. And it was different times back then, but he's one of 11, which means it's a very big and chaotic household. And uh, it was different times back then, but often when his younger siblings uh, would get, uh, get into do the wrong thing, he would, they would get beaten uh, by my grandma. And my dad, he would step in to take the hit for them. And he would do that because he loves them. And he, even though he's done nothing wrong, he would step in and he would take it for them as an act of love for his siblings. In Jesus, he takes the hit for us, even though we deserve it. He has done nothing wrong. He is our sinless Savior. But he takes it for us to heal our relationship with God. We're called right because of this servant, Jesus. What act of grace? What act of love? What more can he do He speaks for us, he bears our pain, he bears our punishment, he even gives his life so that we can be right with God. You know, to this day, uh, I am still amazed at how good and kind and gracious God is, that he would do this for us in Jesus. You know, every time we come to uh, these passages that remind us of our sin, I I reflect and I think, well, wow, like after my failings and mistakes, after... Uh, years of um, dabbling in drunkenness and immorality and hurt that I've caused others. God is gracious to me and he's gracious to you and to us. When we see Jesus, he pours out his life for us on the cross. He takes the hit for us so that we can be right with God. That's what the servant does. And more than that, Here we see he's also raised and exalted. The hint is there in verse 12. He doesn't stay dead. This servant is given a portion among the great. What's that meant to mean? He is in some ways raised up and lifted up, given a a part of greatness with the great. (laughs) Whatever, Whatever that means, here's what I think it means. When you read other parts of Scripture, Ephesians would say, Jesus is seated in the heavenly places, far above every rule, every authority, every power, every name in this age and the next. The Apostle Paul would say Jesus is the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God. And when you look at Revelation, which I'm excited that we'll get to look at Revelation later this year, you will see Jesus in all his glory, He's called the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. This is the servant in all his greatness and all his glory. Jesus, King Jesus, is given a portion among the great. Now, just to tie this together, how does all this impact us today? What does all this mean for us? Isaiah 53, how does that speak to us? It really depends on where you stand with God. Again, I I cannot assume that everyone here follows Jesus. There will be some people here who do, and some people here who are still working things out. And so if you're here, and 
you follow Jesus already, to you, that's awesome. That is great. We can celebrate and we can give thanks for the work that Jesus has done. Isn't it awesome to reflect again on the work that Jesus has done for us? Yeah, I would not think my first place to go would not be Isaiah 53 to think of the person and work of Jesus. But I've changed my mind. That's actually a really great place to go to, uh, to see the work of Christ and the grace that he's shown us. We follow a king that is higher than any other, more powerful than any other. Rest assured, he is good and in control. He is Lord and Savior. And so for us, it, just, it means we keep persevering in this work of making and maturing disciples. We continue the work of this servant, the Apostle Paul would say. He applies this servant language to himself as a servant of the gospel. And so just like Paul and the apostles, we are servants of the gospel. We know Christ and we make Christ known to all. So keep, keep it up. Keep persevering. Let me encourage you, commend that to you. If you're here and you're still exploring Jesus, or you don't follow Jesus yet, like we heard on Friday, don't overlook him. There's nothing particularly attractive about this servant, at least on, first, on face value, at first glance. Don't overlook this Jesus. You know, I'd love to spell this out a little bit more, either to you privately in conversation or in a one-to-one or in small groups, but here's the gist of it. If this part of the Bible is true, then we need to take Jesus seriously. This servant comes alive in Jesus. If Jesus is real, then we need to take the resurrection seriously because Jesus dies and rises from the dead. And if the resurrection is real, see how it kind of builds on each other, then we need to take seriously what this means for us. Here, here's a couple of things that it means for us. It means God has total and complete control over death and life. This life is not all that there is. When we see Jesus, we see that there is living proof that there is life after death. And it's been backed up, not only by God's Word, but you know, there's, there's more. Uh, you can read you know, books like these that speak of, that people have done the work to spell out, well, actually, can we trust the Gospels? What are we actually reading when we read the Bible? There's actually a lot of historical background to it, a lot of evidence from Christian and non-Christian sources to say that this Jesus figure is real. And so from there, we can find out more. Well, he is worth trusting. It means we need to consider him seriously if we haven't already. Don't overlook him. Don't leave today without talking to someone about him. We'd love to serve you in that way. It is not, there is no silly question. It is worth our time and worth your time to find out more about this King Jesus. He truly rose from the dead. How can anyone do that? Well, when we see Jesus, we're meant to see it's the power of God, the one who creates and gives the breath of life. And so it all flows on uh, from each other. Uh, if you're not convinced about the Bible or Jesus or the resurrection, please, uh, let me commend that to you. Please speak to someone. It is better, better to think it through before you go all in for Jesus. That's very normal. It is counting the cost before you go all in and commit to following Jesus. Because Jesus asks for nothing less. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Anyone who would want to follow me, it's all in for Jesus. Uh, if that's you, if you've actually worked through all those things and you're actually ready to accept Jesus and follow him, uh, I'm not going to ask you to come to the front, I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up, but uh, just to spell out for you uh, what I'd like you to do, well, I'm going to pray a prayer after this. Uh, and you, you can pray with me uh, in your heart, quietly to yourself. In case it's not spelt out, a Christian uh, is someone who receives Jesus as their Savior and walks with Jesus as their Lord. And so if you acknowledge this truth in your heart, I'm a sinner, and thank you for Jesus for dying for me. I will now live your way and follow in your steps. If that is you, then you are a Christian. And if that's you, that is great news. It's wonderful. Welcome to the family. And I'm going to lead us in prayer after this, and I would invite you to pray quietly in your heart. And please do tell someone if that's you. If you're not ready, that's also okay. Um, we'd yeah, love for you to keep joining us uh, in fellowship together. Easter is great news. It's such sweet news that we follow a risen Savior. He didn't stay dead. If he did, it would be very sad. But we have living proof. Jesus is risen. Our God is satisfied with the work that is done. His death is enough. 
You know, I didn't grow up hearing this message. And I'm forever grateful for my uni friends who persisted. They, they kept inviting me to lunchtime Bible talks. I kept declining. They kept uh, inviting me uh, to media conferences. I finally said yes because I got a discount. And I had an, another friend who was coming. And it's, it's such good news. Better than anything else you'll ever hear. We may not love God, but He loves us first. We may not believe we need forgiveness, but if we're honest, we have done wrong. And God offers us forgiveness for all the, our wrongs, all our shame, all our guilt, all paid for, fully satisfied in Jesus. And not only that, we have a Savior who is risen. He leads us and guides us as a Savior, as a Lord, and as friend. We have a hope that lies beyond death, life beyond the grave. If you'd like to find out more, uh, if you're still not convinced about that and you'd love to want to talk about it, please do talk to someone. But for now, let me pray. Uh, let's give thanks that Jesus is risen, truly, and praise and honor him this day because the cross is empty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that Jesus died for us and that he didn't stay dead. Thank you that he is truly risen and that this is a truth uh, that is persuasive and convincing, and a truth that is sweet. Uh, thank you that Jesus is both Lord and Savior and friend. And thank you that we who follow Jesus are brothers and sisters in Christ, that together we can serve you and follow you and spur each other on uh, to live for you. We thank you for everyone that's gathered here today, and we ask uh, for those of us who do follow Jesus that you may encourage our hearts with this truth, help us to keep walking with Jesus, persevering uh, and following him with all our hearts, soul and mind. For those here who are yet uh, making, that are still making up their mind about Jesus, uh, we pray that uh, they would investigate the facts and find out for themselves and be convinced uh, about whether Jesus is the truth or not. Pray that they may make up their mind. Uh, pray that many more will come to follow him and put their trust in him and help us as a body in Christ to serve one another and to love all those who are finding out more about you. Uh, we pray that our time today will be fruitful and encouraging. Uh, lastly, we just thank you as well for all those who are serving us today, for the music team, for those who are uh, cooking the food, uh, for those who are uh, looking after our kids and teaching them about you. Thank you for all your servants and all their hard work. Help us to keep doing this work as your servants of the gospel and to keep uh, bringing glory and honor to you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.